Do you ever get your sketchbook out or set up your whole workspace to draw, only to find yourself paralyzed by how to start? You sit there, staring at the blank canvas, twiddling your thumbs, racking your brain on how to make the first mark. So you open Pinterest or Instagram, desperately scrolling for inspiration, until finally, you slump down out of hopelessness. I'm here to help you out of that rut. Here are 12 ways to loosen up those fingers and warm up your imagination. Part one, back to the basics. These first few exercises are all about developing control and muscle memory, so you can confidently use the basic shapes as building blocks to draw more complex objects later on. Number one, lines. Okay, okay, now I know that drawing lines probably seems like the most boring way to warm up, but just hear me out. I challenge you to draw parallel lines of varying lengths from different angles. It's not as easy as it seems, and it's really satisfying to get it right. Practice getting your parallel lines as close as you can, and try making them fast as opposed to dragging the pen slowly. During this exercise, I'm trying to use my whole arm as opposed to just bending at the wrist, especially when drawing the longer parallel lines. I didn't do as great of a job of it when I was drawing the smaller ones, but this will help you draw the lines more fluidly because your arm movement range is much larger than that of your wrist. Number two, circles and ellipses. This one's kind of a two-in-one because an ellipse is basically just a circle on a different plane if you think about it. Which you should, because the ability to pivot objects in space in your mind's eye will help when we eventually give these flat objects some volume. When I'm making these circles, I kind of rev my arm in a circular motion as if I'm a helicopter propeller preparing for landing. It helps me keep my whole arm in motion so I don't rely on my wrist. As with drawing straight lines, you tend to get a better effect when you keep your wrist locked and draw with the entire arm from the shoulder as opposed to from the wrist. For some reason, I feel more comfortable drawing ellipses from left to right than from the opposite direction. You can always just rotate the canvas to draw shapes from the angle that feels most optimal to you. But it's also good to, you know, eat your vegetables, practice your weaknesses, that whole spiel. Number three, rectangles. Last but not most basic, we have rectangles. Whether you're drawing lines, circles, or rectangles, picture turning them in space and try drawing them at different angles and perspectives. Perfecting these foundational elements now will help give us a jumping off point to tackle more difficult subject matter later. Part two, getting more complex. In these next few warm-up exercises, we'll start to turn those basic shapes into little Legos with which we can create new ideas. Number four, 3D shapes. We just practiced drawing flat planes floating in space, now let's give them some volume. Try making rectangular prisms, spheres, cylinders, triangular prisms, cones. Being able to create dimension will help you when you need to start putting objects in perspective or considering the different planes of the piece that aren't immediately visible to the untrained eye, like the human body. In retrospect, I probably could have saved myself some time and reused the shapes from the previous exercise, but Instead, I got a little extra practice by creating a whole new set of 2D shapes to turn three-dimensional. Whoops. <laughs> Number five, 3D cutouts. Looks like someone didn't learn their lesson from the last missed opportunity. Instead of reusing the 3D objects from the last exercise, I drew whole new ones, so I'll speed through a lot of this to focus on the cutout parts, but basically it's exactly what it sounds like, cutting out pieces of 3D objects. A lot of the objects we see in real life are not going to fit into perfect categories like rectangular prisms. They might have negative space, like a couch for example. So we can use these shapes as a reference point and then carve away and mold them into more intricate ideas that might start to resemble things we see in real life. Which brings us to our next warm-up exercise, number six, arrange shapes into compound objects. Try stacking or gluing various shapes together on your canvas from different viewpoints and angles. If you think about it, our world is really just shapes cut out, rearranged, and then joined together. If you can learn to see these concepts in abstraction, it'll become easier to analyze objects you see in real life in the same manner. Part three, starting to create. Hopefully you're starting to feel a little more warmed up by now, a little less stiff. We're just getting to the fun part. Number seven, varying pencil pressure. 
For this exercise, I increased the pressure smoothing a bit so as not to risk any jittery lines distracting me from the focus. Try creating spirals and S lines with alternating line weights. See if you can only add pressure on the downward strokes of squiggly lines. Line variation is a super powerful skill that can be used to indicate weight, shadow, depth, add dynamism, and keep things from looking flat. Here are some examples of how pencil pressure and line weight variation can bolster figure drawings. In this first sketch, I'm using darker and thicker lines to indicate the heaviness of the palm. I tapered the line where the wrist and palm connect to express that the palm is overlapping in front of the wrist, which gives the hand a little more depth as opposed to drawing the connection point with a thick line all the way through. The thicker lines also indicate that the palm and wrist are in shadow. I use thinner lines to show that the fingers are lightly dangling and are not as weighty as the other parts of the hand, and to imply which parts of the fingers are touched by the light source. I also sketched a few more limbs to further show how line variation can simultaneously illustrate light and shadow, dynamism, and weight distribution. If we were to only use the same line thickness for the entire outline and inner details, it would either kind of get monotonous or it'd be difficult to tell the different features of the body parts apart. Our job as the artist is to guide the viewer's eye through the piece with intentional line work, rather than asking them to wade through a forest of identical lines to see the main idea. Number eight, paint blobs and try to make something out of it. I ended up trying out this exercise in a couple different ways. The first one was just lines only. I started with one blob and randomly began adding lines to it to give it some dimension. Then I thought, hmm, that kind of looks like a flower. So I went with that and drew a bee coming to pollinate the flower. Then I wanted to add a stem and some big leaves, which made me think that the flower could be a lure, like a Venus flytrap, but for bees? I don't know, I don't hate bees, so I'm not sure why my mind took this route. But I drew teeth on the leaves, so if the bee gets too close, it'll trigger the trap and the leaves will bite down on the bee. I also did another blob exercise that I think is pretty common where you just paint splotches on a canvas and try to see what pops out at you. Kind of like a Rorschach test or cloud gazing. As I was still painting the blobs, I was already seeing images in the amorphous forms and these are what resulted from it. A little rabbit and I guess a baby dragon. Number nine, paint blobs and keep it blobby. That's a real term, right? <laughs> This is an exercise in going with the flow and learning to generate something when you don't have anything in mind. I picked this up from a certain artist whose name I can't remember right now, but I'll link their name in the description. For some reason, this method was really revolutionary to me, a whole new way to look at doodling to loosen the mind. So I created a few renditions of this exercise as well. The first one I didn't like as much, but I just kept going with it to see where it would take me and I ended up including it in the video because I felt like it was important for you to see that there is no wrong or bad way to do these activities, even if you're not crazy about the results. Give yourself the space and compassion to experiment. The second time I did this exercise, I focused less on lighting the forms and just kept it a bit cloudier or dusty looking. <laughs> and I think I enjoyed the process a little bit more. I also noticed that I didn't second guess myself as much the second time around, nor did I feel the need to press undo much at all. Just content to ride the creative doodle wave. Number 10, blind contour drawing. This one just really gets me out of my own head and helps me let go of the idea that everything always has to be perfect. It was especially useful when I was starting a new sketchbook and was really nervous about ruining the first few pages with something awful. Starting with something that was already going to be imperfect by nature took all of the pressure away. It's totally fine to do a little bit of peeking when you're doing this, just to double check your hand placement and make sure your Picasso faces are still actually ending up on the canvas and in the same general region. You'll see examples here of both complete blind contour and some sneak peeks, but for the most part, I try not to glance at the canvas too much and just concentrate on observing the reference, trying to understand the shapes that I'm seeing. I think this exercise is really great because you're forced to focus less on getting an exact likeness to the model and more on putting down intentional or confident marks, which gives the drawing more life, even if they do look a bit like Mr. Potato Head. Number 11, draw your forte. For me, that's portraits and faces. 
There's something I'm really used to drawing and practice doing all the time. I hope I didn't just jinx myself by saying that. So I tend to start in my comfort zone, which can be a good or bad thing depending on how you look at it. Because if the drawings turn out bad, then I'll just beat myself up about not meeting my expectations. But if it's good, then everybody's happy. And today was a decent day. I just quickly threw down paint on the canvas and tried to only spend a few minutes on each portrait to get the main idea. Notice that I'm using circles. There are straight lines and spheres involved. I'm varying my line weight. So we're really starting to implement a lot of the things that we practiced earlier. Hmm. Number 12. Draw your weakness. Not like, oh, your weakness is that you've got trouble staying organized, so draw a tidy room. If the previous exercise was about drawing something you're more confident in drawing, then this exercise is meant to focus on subject matter you're not as familiar with. So I pulled from a large album of pictures of my cat, Mike, and also used a few cat poses from Pinterest for reference. I'm not super well versed in cat or animal anatomy, but I feel like I stare at Mike so often that I seem to have absorbed some understanding of his mechanics solely from constant observation, so these turned out a little better than I anticipated. The last kitty, however, put up a bit of a fight. You can tell I really struggled with the pose, but it wasn't even a picture of Mike, so... <laughs> So there you have it. You don't need to do all 12 of these. These are just some exercises to get you started. So pick which ones call out to you and have fun with it. If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and let me know what you found helpful. Thanks for watching.